We are awaiting a phone call call from a guest so uh as we await his call we can begin with the show with some hobby news briefs uh the hobby news brief of the week is the legendary pittsburgh pirate uh ball player bill mazeroski who's 83 years old is expected to sell his personal uh collection uh 17 year career bill mazeroski played for the pittsburgh pirates and his auction is scheduled for January 1st, which he will be auctioning off some of his uh, treasure items. A lot of his hardware and memorabilia will be auctioned off uh, by auctioneer company in Pennsylvania. And Mazeroski uh, will be moving. The story is Mazeroski will be moving out of their home, and uh, he needs to liquidate some of his stuff. Now, from what I understand, Mazeroski did have an auction years ago selling uh, a lot of his uh, material, which grossed over a million dollars, over a million dollars. So I believe Mazeroski is selling the remaining part of his collection in what is called a New Year's Day auction on January 1st. So if you want to uh, check that out on Online, you can type in the Bill Mazeroski auction January 1st, and you can see some of his uh, uh, legendary items that are being auction, auctioned for sale. Now, uh, speaking about Mazeroski, since I'm on the topic, uh, as we all uh, collectors know, Bill Mazeroski's rookie uh, baseball card was uh, issued in 1957 by the Topps Company. And, you know, Bill, Ma- Bill Mazeroski, popular player. He he uh, he is definitely known for that walk off home homer in Game Seven in the uh, World Series. And the uh, fifty seven tops Bill Mazeroski card is an affordable card. Uh, you could pick one up ungraded for about uh, thirty bucks in nice shape. Uh, if you get, if you're looking for a high grade Bill Mazeroski card, I mean some of them are listed at almost thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand dollars if you're looking to uh, if you're a Pittsburgh pirate fan and you like Bill Mazeroski and you're looking to obtain a high grade Bill Mazeroski rookie card, it would be from 57, as I just noted. And uh, his high grade cards in high grade condition graded, uh, there's one online for about close to $30,000 graded near graded mint, gem mint, actually gem mint for $30,000. So again, condition is a factor when uh, collectors are buying these uh, cards, uh, Condition has always been great. So we have a, a guest on the telephone line, and uh, I welcome in on the phone line is American musician and best known as an electric blues guitarist, singer, songwriter, producer. He's a blues hall of famer. We welcome Joe Lewis Walker, Joe Brian C, KMET Radio. Thanks for being on. Hey Brian, thanks for having me. Absolutely, sir. You were born in San Francisco and took up guitar at age fourteen. Joe, who were some of your very first influences in music? Well, um, being the youngest of five and, you know, um, a lot of cousins, I, I, I listened to a little bit of everybody. I got trickled down, you know, everything. So, I mean, just to be quite honest, my father, you know, would play a lot of older blues guys uh, that he'd listen to when he was in living in Mississippi. And my mother played a lot of stuff that she listened to and my brothers and sisters also. So I got a heavy dose of everybody from B.B. King to Muddy Waters to, to my sisters listening to the... the uh, little Richard to my brothers listen to the Temptations to my older sister listen to Elvis Presley to to everything you know growing up so uh, that's sort of um uh, I just got a, a sort of a comprehensive uh, <laughs> you know um, education in in music although blues is sort of like um what I what uh, I'm known for uh, and I I was always uh, a, a pretty decent guitar player uh, so I I, I was um. A little bit ahead of the curve, because a lot of guys, when I was growing up, they they just played the songs that were played on the radio, whereas, you know, my mom made me go take some classes, so I had to study scales and things like that a little bit and try to, it wasn't enough for her, for me, to like to play music. She wanted me to know music, you know, and so um, I think that right. was uh, part, of, part of my mother's sort of personality, and my father's personality was, you know, you got to listen to this. You know, because this is the this is the real thing, and so, you know, you get that that sort of something that your parents wish they could have done, but but you know, due to situations, they could neither one of them could, could do it, 
And so, um, you know, they sort of lived vicariously through me. So, Joe, you mentioned your dad. Was he, uh, was he, was he tough on you growing up uh, as far as, uh, you know, he wanted you to succeed in music? Or is it something that you took up on your own? Uh, no, I, 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 you know, I, I, you know it, it's sort of weird. You know, my father was a um, uh, construction worker. And, 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 you know, when he'd come home from work in construction, uh, you know, I was a little kid. And he'd be playing his records on a little 45 record player. You know, and my brother and sister would be waiting for him to get through with the record player to put on the latest uh, Chuck Berry record or Little Richard or Fast Domino or whoever was popular. Um, but I would sit there with my father and say, play more of those songs that you just played. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, well, that's, that's Howlin' Wolf. I said, well, I don't know who that is. Just play it. And he said, well, that's Sonny Boy Williamson. Well, just play it. So, and, and Lord and behold, when he, when he played T-Bone Walker and I heard the guitar, I was like, oh man, I, I you know, I gotta do this. I gotta, I, how do you do that? You know, and so, of course, it's always left up to moms to be the one to say, well, <laughs> the first thing you gotta do is, is get a guitar. <laughs> you know, and the second thing you gotta do is, you know, uh, take, you know, some lessons and so you know what you're doing and, and, and things of this nature. So I, I, I would, you know, I, I say this to most interviewers and they sort of laugh at me, but say, well, who's the most important? you know, musicians in your life. And it wasn't musicians. It literally was my mother and father. It, coming from different angles, you know, um, putting music in my heart and in my soul and, and in my mind, you know, and my older brothers and sisters, you know, what they did. And also, and, and then later on when I got to be about 12 years old, I, uh, we moved to the Fillmore District in San Francisco. And lo and behold, uh, four, of my co- four of my cousins were in the same band. You know, and I wow. thought, oh, this this is heaven for me. So it took a couple of years for me to break my way in there, but really to get in there. But um, I did, and then that was that just opened the whole door. Man, I have a lot of questions for you. Let me see if I can get through all of them. How, how did you get your first break into music industry? Did you have mentors in, in the business? Well, it, you know, in in the industry, uh, you know, where I'm originally from, I'm originally from from, from the Bay Area, from San Francisco. Um, I, I was in a place already. I, w- I was in the Fillmore District. Um, we had our Fillmore Auditorium, which was, which was sort of like the Apollo Theater from New York, you know, and all the great acts. The same acts that played the Apollo Theater, when they came to the West Coast, they'd play the, the, the Fillmore Auditorium. Um, Little Richard, I saw him when he got a religion. Uh, the Temptations, the real Temptations, James Brown, when he, before he got a new bag, and you see gospel shows there. I mean, it, it was literally... You know exactly like the Apollo Theater for us on on the West Coast, and uh, I went to junior high school like a, like, a, like a like a block away, and we'd have our battle of the bands there at the, at the Fillmore Auditorium and 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 dances, and they'd have the you know the the the, the Elks and <laughs> things all you know community type stuff, and I seen it change um, when um, Chet Helms and the Mime Troupe and Bill Graham came. And they started, uh, you know, having for a lot of younger people who were leaving all points, north, south, de- west, the United States, wanting to come to San Francisco to, you know, to be themselves, to, to sort of drop some of the baggage that had been laid on on them. And I shouldn't just say from the United States, people, all kind of people came from all over the world with San Francisco, you know, when I was like 15, 16, you know, to, to find themselves, to tune in, drop out, to and all that stuff, and and all the bands that that were that were started, that were formulating uh, the airplane with 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 Marty Ballin, rest his soul, or the Dead with Jerry and them, rest Jerry's soul, and 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 you had uh, in my neighborhood, uh, we had a uh, Sly Stewart and his brother Freddie Stewart, and one of my cousins was the bass player in that band for quite a while, and you had all all that going on, and across the East Bay, maybe a little bit later, you had uh, Tower Power with the East Bay Grease. In Marin County, you had a, a lot of more 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 hippie acts like the Quicksilver Messenger Service, and 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 you know in Haight Ashbury we had band houses where bands literally lived in houses. You could just go over and jam. We had um, uh, uh, on Clayton Street we had the Big Brother House, which was Chet Helms' house, which was you know Big Brother and Holy Company, which was Janis Joplin. Around the corner from me, I lived on Waller and Ashbury. Around the corner in Ashbury was the Dead House up the hill. Um, and just like that, you know, a bunch of bands, a bunch of young people finding themselves and and really rewriting, you know, um, rewriting history, to be quite honest about it. 
Yeah, now I, I, I read you you've been performing for uh, half a century, and I read you were introduced to Jimi Hendrix by Mike Bloomfield. Did uh, can you talk about that? Is that is that correct to say? Did Jimmy ever give you advice? How is he as a person? Well, actually, it wasn't Michael. It was Michael's okay. drummer. It was Michael's drummer at the okay. time. Uh, his drummer at the time was a guy named Buddy Miles. Uh, Michael had quit a, a band called the Paul Porterfield Blues Band, and uh, and um, some kind of way he ended up in the house with me and a guy named Johnny Kramer. Johnny Kramer was a trust fund baby from Chicago. His cousin was a guy named Barry Goldberg, who was also um, one of the many guys that left you know the West Coast trying to find a, a, a more uh, a lifestyle that agreed with him. And to make a long story short, um, Michael said, Joe, I'm, we're starting a band. I'm leaving the Butterfield Band. I'm starting a horn band, like Al Cooper's band, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I'm going to call it the Electric Flag. But I got nowhere to put the drummer. You know, I got these musicians. And I want the drummer to stay with you and Johnny. So the drummer was like man, about 18, and I was about 16 and a half, 17. And the drummer was Buddy Miles. And so our job was to take Buddy around and let him practice every day to a place called the Bridge Theater. And Buddy was always telling me and, J- and Johnny Kramer about this guy, Jimi Hendrix. You know, oh, man, he's a legend on the circuit. You know, he's, you know, and people don't know who he is now, but they're going to find out. And this is before he was real famous. You know, I mean, so I feel great, man. I love to meet him. So you fast forward it um, to after the Monterey Pop Festival, and Jimmy was huge, so he came to San Francisco he headlined a, a Bill Graham show at the Fillmore. We went and seen them, and but he had a party for him afterwards. It was a, Jimmy was the headlining act. The Cream was the middle act. Albert King was the opening act. So we had a big party, but he had a big party for Jimmy. And I, I got to meet him then, and, and Jimmy needed rehearsal space, so I had a space uh, at a place called the Heliport where all the musicians used to rehearse. And Jimmy used my space, which was kind of... Was, was kind of me, but then again, I, I got borrowed the space from Buddy, and Buddy had borrowed it from Bloomfield. It just moved around. So in, in, anyway, I, I, yeah, I, I got to be around Jimmy a, a few times, and and you know, I, I just always noticed that you know when he wasn't talking to young ladies very softly, he was always noodling with a guitar. You know, just always noodling, always noodling, always noodling. And I remember one time Bloomfield just said, "I wish that guy would quit noodling." And then one day, I don't know, about a year, about six months later, Buddy Miles brought the acetate to an album called Axe as Bold as Love. And when all the musicians, you know, picked their jaw up off the ground after hearing what all the stuff that Jimmy had done with all those different guitar sounds, we just turned to Michael and said, Michael, we said, Michael, that was all that noodling. <laughs> that was all that. He knew what he was doing. He just, you know, and, and we all, as musicians, we all know it. You know, we, we hear little sounds in our head, and we're doing this, and we're doing that, and we're doing this, and we're doing And it doesn't make any sense. If you're somebody just sitting in a room, you, it doesn't make any sense. You know, what, what the hell is this guy, what is he on about, as they say in England? What is he on about? And, you know, now you can see because they've released you know, uh, makings of this. They they released the Beatles' makings of this record. And that. and you could see, you know, how simple things start or how left, you know, something out of the total left wing, left field starts. And then, you say, man, you got to be kidding. That's how that song started and it ended up there? Well, that's how it works, you know. Nothing starts. Uh, I always say, you know, you got to start at the beginning. You, you, you never start in the middle or you start at the end. You start at the beginning, Right. Now, now we're talking to Blues Hall of Famer Joe Lewis Walker. Joe, uh, take yourself out of the equation. If you had to uh, rate the greatest guitarist of all time, would you put Jimmy as number one? How about Eric Clapton? Well, no, to me, um, there is, you know what, I'll put it like this. If you, if I was to ask you who was the greatest Athlete of all times, and you you said Muhammad Ali, or you said Mar- Rocky Marciano. No, that's the greatest boxer of all time. That's not the greatest athlete of all time. The greatest athlete of well, either Jackie Robinson, is it Mickey Mantle? No, that's the greatest baseball player. So, so you, you follow where I'm coming from. Good point. To to, to me, yeah, good point. Good point. To, to me, to to try to put Jimi Hendrix or Mike Bloomfield in a category with Django Reinhardt or Charlie Christian or B.B. King is unfair. 
to try to put John Lennon in a category with someone like a, a, a Muddy Waters is unfair because it's two different things. So, you know, and, and there's eras. There's different eras. And, and if you wanted to say, well, who's the greatest guitar player that lasted the longest eras? Who, who was famous from the 40s? until the day he died, influenced everybody. Who are the most famous guitar players who, without them, the genres that they helped invent would not have existed? Well, try this on for size. Go, Johnny, go. Take that out of music. Take, take that out of music. You know, take it out of music and then see how many great guitar players you have. Zero. Because without Chuck Berry doing rock and roll, there's no platform for Keith Richards. There is no platform for George Harrison. Without B.B. King playing that style of blues, there is no platform for Joe Louis Walker or Eric Clapton. It wasn't invented. You know, what are you going to play? What are you going to play, Eric Clapton? What are you going to play, Joe Louis Walker? Well, I'll think of something. Yeah, you'll think of something, but is it is going to be as successful as what B.B. King did? Real, making people realize when you when you hear that sound, that's the blues. He didn't have to explain it. He didn't have to sing it. He didn't need a, a, a thesaurus to explain it to people. He didn't need a symphony orchestra. He didn't need dancing girls. He didn't need rappers. He just had to play two notes. One note to get your attention and one note to dis- resolve it. And you knew it was B.B. King. And when you knew it was B.B. King, what's the next thing you're going to say? That's the blues, right? Right? Absolutely, yep. Okay, yep. now, if you take a record from Joe Lewis Walker, he say, hey, man, that guy sounds pretty good. Oh, that's a bluesier song. Oh, that's a rockier song. Oh, that's a thisier song. Everything that B.B. King plays, someone says, oh, well, that's B.B. King. That equates to the blues. Oh, that's Chuck Berry. That equates to rock and roll. How many people can say, that they invented something that literally, when you mention the person's name, they can mention a genre of music. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> no, I got you, I got you. Uh, let's talk about the Boss Talkers, Joe. Um, how did that formation begin, the Boss Talkers? Well, that began in about 85, 85 when I, I was performing... Uh, on, on tour, a couple of months world tour with a group called Mississippi Delta Blues Band. And I, when I left, I, I kept my money and, and, and I did some demos and I, and I was auditioning guys in the Bay Area. And, and so um, I have a friend named uh, Clarence Guitar Sims, better known as Phil Slim. And he used to call me, oh, Joe Lewis Walker, the boss talker. You can talk boss. Huh? So we named the group the boss talker. And it was three of, uh, I think a couple of, two or three just stations of the group at the time. And and it was a good group when when I had it together, you know, and it lasted for a while, and that that was great, you know. Then I had another group and, after and, that. And that la- I'm sorry. And that la- now the Boss Talkers that was on the high tone label, is that correct? Yeah. Uh huh. Right, mm-hmm. and then after a long partnership with High Tone, you signed with Polygram, right? Yes, I did. Now, now what what would you say ended the relationship? Uh, with high tone and did polygram treat you better that did, did that have anything to do with it ending the relationship well uh, uh, with, with with high tone uh, with, with, when, with, yeah when with I, uh, high tone when i joined high tone they were an independent label a small label they had a uh, four or five artists um that were maybe selling records and then one of their artists had a mil- couple of million selling records being the, the artist being robert craig robert had a couple million selling records well, I I'd been on high tone and had let out two records by then, and um, the big labels, Polygram and then Mercury came and, and snatched up Robert from high tone. So high tone put a little bit more energy into me, and uh, I, I did four records, actually five, because the three of them were live records. And, and um, so, of course, when you're in, on a smaller label, you want to transition to a bigger label. Well, it just happened that Polygram came knocking on my door, but I fulfilled my contract with with um, with High Tone. So it was just a logical thing of you know, it's like being in the minor leagues. 
you know, and, and you're playing for the for the <laughs> for the Pawtucket Panthers, and you and you want to get up to the Boston Celt, the Boston uh, Red Sox, you know, and the Red Sox call you, and you got an opportunity, and you make the best of it, and and, and so uh, th- that's what I did. But um, and, uh, working with High Tone was uh, was instrumental in in me becoming anything uh, as far as a professional uh, re- uh, recording artist because. I was afforded the opportunity to be myself on high tone. They, they, in fact, they were looking for guys who weren't so much traditional blues, uh, and who weren't so much um, uh, 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 who, who, who sort of had their own vision of themselves, and and uh, they sort of struck gold with with Robert, and and uh, they 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 were really receptive to me because you know they 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 knew that I played guitar and that I'd come out of church and and this that and the other basically. But they didn't know a lot about me. They didn't know that I played slide guitar. They didn't know that I'd uh, been a, <laughs> that I'd been in a lot of older guys' bands and and this, that, and the other. I sort of came through the ranks, you know. I sort of came through the ranks, and and so um, they were pretty, pretty, uh, 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 su- very supportive of me. Bruce Bromberg and who ran High Tone mostly at, at, in, in the recording studio, at, and Larry Sloven, who um, who handled the um, the, the business. Um, they were. Really uh, supportive of a lot of not just me, uh, uh, Robert Cray, uh, James uh, Armstrong, and then guys whose career had been behind them a little bit. They brought some of those guys back, guys like Joe Ely, and uh, then they found newer guys through Joe Ely, like Jimmy Dale Gilmore and uh, Butch Hancock, what they call the Flatlanders out of out of Texas, love it. And so they they were really eclectic. They were Americana before the word ever came. And it's amazing that I think one of the first awards that Americana gave out. Was to the high tone label, you know. So that that was good. Wow. That was good. Now, well, I have a few minutes left, Joe. Uh, let's fast forward to 2013. A uh, special year for you. You were inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame. I mean, that that must have been something special for you. I mean, great performers such as Aretha Franklin, Count Basie, and so many more in the Hall of Fame. Can you take us back to receiving that award? Well, it was it was great. You know, I. I it was sort of bittersweet because some of my mentors had just been, you know, uh, inducted the year before. Like Bloomfield had just been inducted the year before. Earl Hooker had just been uh, inducted, and these are guys that had helped me out. You know, a young guy like me. So, but it it was um, it was great. I, one of my daughters came, and and some of my best friends came, and and it it was it was just a really really um, one of those things you never thought would would, would get. I mean, now they have have. All kinds of halls of fame, you know. Uh, uh, but the one in Memphis, uh, 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 sanctioned by the Blues Foundation, is the one you're talking about, which to me is the real Blues Hall of Fame, you know. Um, and and that's the, it, it's a good one. You know. I mean, that's it, jo- Joe. I mean, you're a Hall of Famer. I mean, everything you ever worked for, you, your entire life is recognized with that award and legitimizes you as one of the greatest of all time. You know. Well, yeah, and and you know it. it it's it's to me I always felt fortunate that you know um to even be mentioned in the same death breath with Muddy Waters or Holland Wolf or some of those guys or or Bloomfield those guys that are in the Hall of Fame uh, uh, Johnny Winters my friend uh, people like that it, it's 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 definitely um us walking in high cotton so to speak so uh, I I really uh you know I was very grateful and to be honest uh you know. Uh, that gave me a, a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of boost. It really did. Well, Joe, we have a cut of one of your songs. Uh, we're going to play that now. Uh, Sean, let's play Joe Lewis Walker. Thank you. 
excellent work, Joe. I, I have a minute left. You want to mention your website and, and your next performances yeah. coming up? Yeah, well, uh, you can just go to JoeLewisWalker.com uh, or catch us on Facebook. And uh, uh, the next, uh, we're uh, doing a little thing in uh, acoustic guitar thing with a friend of mine, Selwyn Birchwood, in, um, in Florida in, in about um, next Saturday. And uh, then about four days later, I'll go to uh, Beijing, China, and then to Shanghai, to the Blue Note Clubs. We're doing a little run, run uh, in China. And then come home, and then we're going to the islands, uh, Bistique Island, for the festival for a couple of weeks, and then Costa Rica. And different places will be all over next year to Israel, Russia, blah, 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 blah. It's like a dog chasing his tail. And we have a new album that will be out next year with a, with a bunch of my friends um, from San Francisco. I have a... Yorma Cochran from the Jefferson Airplanes on one cut. We got Mitch Ryder from the Detroit Real Wheels and Albert Lee, of course, uh, the great uh, guitar player. And we have uh, Carla Cook, Sam Cook's daughter, singing a duet. And and uh, Jesse Johnson from the Time, Jelly Bean Johnson, uh, Dion Demucci, the King of New York, my wow. brother. He's on a one track that we did. And uh, uh, Doyle, Baby Doll, Doyle Bram Hall II, Keb Moe's on the record. Um, David Bromberg, uh, John, my brother John Sebastian from the Love and Spoonful days, and uh, a bunch of more of my friends are on the record, and, and it should be out next March. And uh, hopefully, uh, um, uh, we're, we're taking some of the proceeds to help for food banks uh, in the United States and, and in the UK. The name of the the title cut is called Feed the Poor. It's written by myself and uh, Gabriel Jagger, Mick Son, and uh, we hope to get, generate some uh, interesting people, you know, helping. Um, you know, with the, with the hunger plight in this world. Yeah, and I checked out that trailer, Viva Las Vegas. Uh, I mean, it's a pr pretty pretty neat. Uh, you want to talk quickly about that, Viva Las Vegas? Yes, that was a fun record. We, we recorded it last year. It's, it's been out a, a couple of months, and and that one's uh, uh, it's it's also a DVD, uh, and and it's 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 generating some interest. Uh, uh, we 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 had a great time there uh, in Vegas playing that club. I played there several times to Railhead. And um, that one is, uh, that's out now. Um, the next record, uh, the Feed the Poor record, will be out in about six, about four or five months. And so we're just, Joe, just trying thank to... you so... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. They're telling me, I, you know, I have, I have to cut it short. I apologize. Right. Can we do this again in the near future? Anytime. I'm waiting when the next record comes out. Okay, you got it, my man. You're a blues icon. I thank you so much for joining the program today. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Take care, Joe. That was Joe Lewis Walker. Until next week, happy collecting to all.